Well, good evening and, and welcome to this uh, inaugural public lecture for uh, the War Studies Research Group at, at York St. John University. This uh, it's a newly formed group that aims to bring together and promote scholars and scholarship of war and conflict in the broadest sense uh, to investigate and understand this perennial part of the human condition. Uh, and in that vein, I am delighted to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Carlo Barquero. Um, we're privileged to have Carla joining us remotely from Baltimore in Maryland, uh, where she is a lecturer in political science and the graduate program administrator uh, in the Department of Political Science at Johns Hopkins University. Carla's teaching and research focuses on human security approaches in international relations, Latin American politics and kinship. Although much of her focus has been on the Americas, Carla is no stranger to these shores, having earned her PhD in international politics from Aberystwyth University. She's produced a number of prestigious publications and papers, including uh, policy papers for Canada's Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade, and opinion editorials for the US political commentary newspaper, The Hill, based in Washington, DC. Carla's scholarship publications uh, include co-authoring uh, the book, Mobilizing the Will to Intervene, Leadership to Prevent Mass Atrocities, which came out in 2010 with McGill Queens University Press. The book was not only well received by scholars, but was seen as a vital public intervention on the topic of, mass, uh, of modern mass atrocities. One reviewer said, this book is a must read for scholars, activists, policymakers, and concerned citizens engaged in the debates around humanitarian intervention. The Montreal Review of Books was forthright in declaring, it's the kind of book that can change the world. So very high praise indeed. Carla has published a number of chapters and articles in recent years and has recently been working on a project exploring the relationship between kinship and international relations. But she's here today to talk to us uh, about human experiences of war. Um, Carla's going to give us um, a short talk, um, about 20 minutes maybe, um, and then we invite you to, to ask questions if you have any, to start a conversation on this. So if you do have questions, please do use the Q&A function to type your questions. If you'd like to remain anonymous, please do tick the, the anonymous box. This is recorded, so uh, we can announce your names if you'd like or, or keep them uh, anonymous, uh, but we will be taking questions. So please type them uh, through the session and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, but with absolutely no further ado, uh, I will hand over to Carla. Thank you so much. Um, I want to give a big thanks to Dr. Graham Callister, to uh, Dr. James Cooper, and to Leanne as well, who set up this webinar today. I'm, I'm really uh, pleased to be with you. Um, and a big thanks to York St. John University for, for hosting this event as well. So my discussion today is on human experiences of war, and it stems from uh, the, the long debated issue surrounding the role of war in political discourse and academic scholarship. Indeed, countless studies in the social sciences and the humanities in particular have dedicated significant attention to exploring and understanding the centrality of war as a scholarly concept, um, as a foreign policy tool, and of course, as a catalyst for societal, economic, and political change. Within political science, war has played a central role since the modern emergence of the discipline in, in and around the 19th century and can be found in the top tier of concepts in the subfield of international relations alongside such notions as, as the state, sovereignty, anarchy, and power. War is a notion that reifies the ontological and epistemological boundaries of the state and the racialized and gendered dichotomies of citizen and non-citizen, national and foreign, and combatant and non-combatant. But more than a concept of intellectual import, war is a practice, a potential human experience, a context that shapes human relationships, particularly those that are the building blocks of social life. Notions of kinship, family, community that are relational in nature are often violently reshaped and reformulated during war, influencing individual identity, a sense of belonging, personal and social understandings of security and physical and mental health. But the perennial questions remain about whether the centrality of war in our understanding of politics is changing and whether these transformations are creating space for alternative perspectives on security for human populations. So I would like to focus most of my comments today on three specific questions. Um, the first is, what is war and how do people experience war? Is war still a core issue when understanding global politics? And what contributions to the understanding of war and conflict can human security approaches provide? 
So ancient thinkers such as Thucydides and Sun Tzu wrote in the period between 50, five, sorry, 550 and 400 BC about war as a mechanism for political change, but one that required careful strategizing and clear goal setting to be successful. So long before the creation of the state system, wars were fought to consolidate and expand power um, and were seen as a necessary element of governance. Prussian military advisor Karl von Clausewitz, writing in the 1830s, argued that war ought to be understood as an extension of politics by other means. For Clausewitz, a typology of war included total wars, or wars fought for survival, and limited wars fought for lesser goals, such as over natural resources or territory. Both types of war could intensify if not contained by reason and clear strategic policy goals. He warned that the task of leaders was to limit war's natural tendency to see violence escalate, expand across territory, and extend over long periods of time. War has traditionally been defined as the orchestrated use of force by the state to defend its national security interests and fulfill its foreign policy objectives. Since the Cold War, however, there has been notable decline in the number of interstate or international wars. As a result, more modern definitions of war have attempted to include non-state actors, particularly in response to the rise of intrastate conflicts or civil conflicts, which emerged through the 1990s and early 2000s. Tarek Barkawi defines war as organized violence between two political entities, which can include any kind of group with resources, leadership, and human and material means to use force against another group. Political entities have some goal in mind, a strategy they see the possibility of achieving through conflict. In 1999, Mary Caldor warned of what she called new wars, where the distinction between traditional wars waged between states and other forms of violence such as civil wars, organized crime, and violent human rights violations were becoming less clear. Caldor asserted that the blurring of lines between conventional war and unconventional forms of violence was fueled by modern processes of globalization, characterized by decentralized war economies and black market financial contributions. For Caldor, these new wars have largely been waged along ethnic lines, with identity politics taking center stage and high levels of civilian casualties being the result. But several scholars, including Tarek Barkawi and Martin Shaw, have demonstrated that these forms of violence and the processes of globalization that fuel them are not entirely new. Caldor does demonstrate, however, that the convergence of diverse forms of violence stemming from the state and non-state actors has significant consequences for how civilians experience war. This complexity of warfare and its connection to diverse forms of repression and violence has rarely been fully acknowledged in the literature. Indeed, one of the main obstacles to taking a broader view of warfare to better understand its complexities has been our reductionist understanding of war as the monopolization of violence by the state. The centrality of the state as both the instigator of war and the referent of security, where it is the state's authority, borders, and national interests which are to be secured and whose interests are to be furthered through warfare, has largely meant that scholarship traditionally conceived of war in narrow terms. Indeed, the dominance of neo-realist and rational choice theories in international relations in particular, where the focus of inquiry has largely been on the state's ability to navigate the anarchy of the international system through the projection of military power has often relegated paradigms that do not singularly prioritize the state or rationalism to the margins of knowledge production. That has begun to change and has begun to do so since the end of the Cold War. As the Cold War ended, there has been renewed attention to global discourse um, on the ways in which civilians are experiencing warfare, but also other forms of violence and insecurity that often beset conflict prone regions. Two of the main concerns were the need to reimagine whose security matters in global affairs and what is the international community's responsibility to protect civilians from violence. From the genocides in Rwanda and Srebrenica in the 90s to mass rape and torture of Muslim women and children in the former Yugoslavia, the international community was left with little understanding of how to respond to these forms of violence, often perpetrated by the state itself. Global discourse began to reassess the long-standing principle of non-interference in the affairs of sovereign states, 
questioning what responsibility international organizations like the UN had to civilians in the face of mass atrocities being committed by states themselves against segments of their own populations. This marked the emergence of human security paradigms and the subjectivities associated with acknowledging the particular diverse experiences of women, people of color, children, people with disabilities, and other groups on the receiving end of marginalization strategies and repressive violence. Feminist scholars such as Cynthia Enloe and Jay Tickner and Laura Schoberg, among others, were very instrumental in, form, in forging new lines of inquiry that illuminated how political discourses about war and conflict and practices in war are gendered. These scholars demonstrated that the use of sexual violence, forced pregnancy, prostitution, et cetera, during war are gendered forms of power that are linked to conflict. And by highlighting the diverse experiences of war, feminist scholars were able to elevate our understanding of warfare as a gendered practice in global politics. Post-structural and post-colonial scholars have also played an important role in illuminating the Eurocentric and white supremacist power dynamics in the depictions of the non-West, particularly in creating singular narratives around war. They have been instrumental at affirming the need to refocus scholarly attention on processes of imperialism, colonialism, and the Western gaze that has formed the basis of our racialized understanding and knowledge around conflict and war. So much of the emerging scholarship in international relations in the post 9-11 period has applied a much more critical lens when examining violence and war. Discourses on security were evolving alongside many of these critical approaches, examining mechanisms to better understand the complexity of human experiences of war. Human security as an approach sought to reconstitute how we understand security in the world. The UNDP Human Development Report in 1994 first laid out some of the definitional boundaries of human security. However, there was significant debate about what those boundaries should be. There did emerge some core areas of agreement on the general parameters of the paradigm. First, there was agreement that human security paradigms seek to shift the referent of security from the state to human beings. The goal of this shift was, shift was to reconceptualize the concept of, of security and shoring up the power of the state from one of shoring up the power of the state to uh, focus on the physical safety and well being of people. Second, with a shift away from state centric um, security paradigms um, and state centric understandings of the uh, referent of security, the potential threats to the security and well being of human beings included, but was not reduced to war. So in fact, examining the subjective nature of how people define the parameters of their own security and insecurity offers up a broader range of harms, such as those stemming from poverty, lack of access to affordable health care and education, disease, social and political repression, gender discrimination, and racism. Third, an understanding of the nature of human-centered insecurities Broaden, broadens the type of harms one must consider and therefore renders military modes of response insufficient in the provision of security, where war itself can be the source of harms to the well being of people. Since the emergence of human security paradigms in the post Cold War period, there has been more complex discourse on war and conflict and greater understanding of how norms associated with gender and biases associated with race shape international rhetoric and actions in conflict. We still have a long way to go to fully realize the potential, I think, of human security to reframe our understanding of war and conflict. Indeed, with the current global pandemic, we are beginning to see some shift in the relevance of non-traditional concerns and how these transnational harms require collective partnerships globally rather than divided nationally driven responses. In today's world, conflicts in Syria, Afghanistan, and Iraq have fueled historic migration crises that have long-term implications for human security. Questions remain about whether we will be able to see greater integration of these human security approaches throughout political discourses on war. And of course, whether we will reformulate our understanding of the centrality of violence in politics. Thanks, open for questions.
fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to uh, mess with my screen there. Um, fantastic. That was uh, really, really interesting um, uh, talk there. Um, are, are there any questions? Sorry, I'm, I'm flobbling around trying to get the screen open. There we go. Um, any questions that anyone has, um, you can type them in the, the questions box. Um, you can, I believe, also raise your hand and I can allow you to talk if anyone is desperate to be recorded. Um, any questions uh, to kick us off, please? Now, I have quite a few. I've scribbled a few notes, but I don't want to monopolize things. I know it's the chair's privilege, but I um, <laughs> don't always like to, uh, to dominate them. But I will um, ask a question to start with. And that's kind of where you see things going in the future, because um, you kind of, you know, you, you took us through the last, I suppose, 25 years, especially um, there in the talk of how these things are developing. So where do you see this this trend going into the future of human security? Um, and it strikes me, especially thinking back in the last couple of months of, of just what I've seen on the news, I've got to be honest, of um, so the, the differences um, in the weight given to human life by Western powers, for example, um, you know, the a threat to British or American civilians and troops in Afghanistan is met with a drone strike that kills a lot of people. Um, mm. And that is seen as acceptable to prevent a threat, credible or not, to, to troops. So we're still, in, in my view, seeing this kind of disparity in, in how different peoples are seen. So where do you see this going in the future, um, this human security uh, angle? Thank you so much for the question, Graham. Um, I, I think, you know, this is an ongoing question when we talk about the diversity of perspectives around what security means, um, you know, what counts as a threat to national security, you use the example of Afga Afghanistan and drone strikes by the US military forces. Um, you know, I, I think there are many countries that have tried to forge ahead um, along the lines of understanding our collective responsibilities to one another. And of course, understanding the subjectivities um, you know, in, involved in under in human security issues. Uh, I do think that we have had, uh, to some extent, uh, a, a sort of resurgence of nationalistic uh, approaches in Cold War thinking, I think, when it comes to conflict. And we see that um, with the ways, you know, war has been waged um, through the war on terror. Um, particularly not sort of imagining, you know, other ways of dealing with terrorist threats than the use of force, than waging conflict in Afghanistan, and of course with any countries allied with uh, the terrorist uh, threat. So I think there are some, some, there's a lot of work to be done if we think that this is a valuable paradigm through which um, we can sort of evolve our thinking around conflict, war, and of course the importance of, uh, of human life. But I, I, I think you're right. I think it depends who you're talking to today, right, in terms of um, how they elevate these kinds of concerns. I do think though, um, even with sort of changing um, ideas around um, the value of human life, I think there is a general, a general, general consensus that's been forged at the international level. I don't think that we can deny that um, largely that has been at the core of what the international community has tried to push forward over the last uh, two decades. Um, um, but I think you're right. I think there are challenges in terms of um, the conflicts we see emerging. I think the migration crisis, particularly um, with uh, after 2015, when we saw the sort of end of the Arab Spring and of course conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, we saw some real challenges, I think, to organizations that had largely touted human security, like the European Union, who didn't really take as progressive a stance as I think they should have on, uh, on the migration question, particularly within um, European countries. So I think we have a lot of challenges left. And I think, you know, one of the, the ways I think we can start to, to sort of um, re-elevate this conversation is looking at our current context, right, in, in the global pandemic, right? The idea that we're focusing um, you know, problematically on national uh, conversations around vaccines and other mechanisms to uh, contain the virus has been really problematic and is showing signs that it's not working, right? So um, I think when we start to, to try to move past these sort of nationalistic or state-centric uh, ways of understanding the world, I think we're going to be much more successful uh, at dealing with the, these sort of transnational issues. And I think that uh, has implications for war and conflict as well. Yeah, it's really interesting. And then reminds me of something that uh, Gordon Brown, you know, the, the former British Prime Minister said recently, um, he was doing an interview and he said, uh, you know, the, the failure of the vaccine program to actually internationalize has 
now come back to bite people. You are seeing variants coming up in different countries because you've been too focused on on your own country. But do you, I mean, do you think that um, modern Western states, especially, are starting to reconceptualize national interest in terms of human security? If we think of you know, the, the response to 9/11, as horrific as 9/11 was, um, it, it, is it the the attack on on American citizens, civilians? Um, that provoked that response, the need for human security, or was it the attack on US sovereignty, in your view? Um, you know, the fact that happened on US soil that provoked that response, are they fundamentally starting to think of national interest in terms of human security, or is it still national interest in terms of sovereignty, power, and more traditional paradigms? You know, I, I think the U.S. is a particular case, and I think it depends um, on what administration you're looking at and the dynamics within the individuals of each administration, if you are looking at the United States in particular. Um, I think there has been movement to sort of understand um, issues around human security. I know, um, having worked in the Foreign Service before, there are, there are connections with the ways in which the United States and its allies think about security, particularly in the, in the hemisphere. So we're talking about Latin America, you know, Central and, and South America, um, and partnering around questions of citizen security, for instance, right? Um, I think there has been some movement on those things at the global level when we think about issues surrounding um, uh, gender mainstreaming and those initiatives. I think the challenge comes from what you just mentioned, right? When an attack on our territory, right, on uh, the United States and its civilians, it often you see this sort of um, knee-jerk reaction to respond in very traditional um, Cold War uh, paradigms, right? And I think that's a real problem. How do we um, test, right, our commitment to these global norms, right, uh, that are emerging? That doesn't mean everyone's following them, but how do we test our resolve, right, if our, our knee-jerk reaction is to respond uh, with the use of force rather than collectively? And so I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, this is not sort of um, an approach that we've seen integrated for sure at every level of governance, whether it's in the United States or any other uh, state. Um, but certainly, I think um, these conversations and these discourses have started to be integrated uh, in particular areas. Um, uh, like we, we mentioned, you know, th issues on gender, um, issues on um, to some extent, non-traditional th threats like international public health. But there's still a lot of work to, do, to be done, there's no question, in sort of changing the conversation. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. That's uh, really interesting. I, I do want to remind everyone, if you do have any questions, please type them in. Uh, I don't want to monopolize things, though I, I sort of got my, my own list of them. Um, so if you do have other questions, please ask. But um, I, I did have a, um, a question about how difficult it can be for, for states who are trying to focus on human security um, to balance up the different um, issues that you've mentioned. So um, you know, problems of, of gender and ethnicity and culture and race. Um, well, obviously there are some cultures that have different approaches to gender. So mm -hmm. an intervention in one area can seem to be undermining another. Um, you know, can seem an attack on someone's culture to intervene so you you can't do that in terms of gender for example how difficult is it for the international community to come to any kind of agreement on that uh, and how difficult is it to actually hold interventions that don't seem to be uh, you know essentially a form of cultural imperialism i suppose um, mm -hmm. imposing your views on others I think that's a great question. You know, I, I think I always use the word intervention uh, very sparingly, right? Uh, what do we mean by that? Um, um, you know, traditionally we've thought about it as, as the use of force and we often reduce these kinds of conversations on human security to, um, you know, these military interventions or interventions on behalf of populations without any consent by the state. But I think it's a much more complex and nuanced um, conversation to be had. I think oftentimes when we think about this sort of cultural relativist argument, I think you're right, we have to think about the diversity of perspectives, whether it's on gender or anything else. Um, but I also think that it, it's important to incorporate the diversity of views from whatever region we're speaking about. Um, so who speaks for, right, that culture or a culture or groups within a particular um, state, right? And I think that's really important, I think, to recognize is 
that inclusivity and diversity of voices that we require to have these conversations um, is essential to being able to sort of progress when we think of uh, protections on gender and, and other kinds of issues. And I think that's really, really important to acknowledge. This should not be a top-down um, imposition by global leaders or by uh, any one state, for instance. It has to come uh, from a bottom-up approach. Uh, and so I think increasingly we're looking at mechanisms for empowerment, right? How do we empower civil society uh, groups to speak and have a voice in, you know, the ways in which uh, their identities, right, are understood uh, or interact with power dynamics of the state and the international community. That becomes really, really important, I think, and more so when we talk about, you know, quote unquote interventions, right? Uh, you know, what role is the international community playing in facilitating um, the protection of, of individuals and, and the empowerment of communities um, to, to sort of speak for themselves on these issues? That's really, really vital, I think, to this conversation. Yeah, uh, thanks. I think we, we've got one of the attendees, uh, Ian. Um, did you uh, have a question? Uh, yeah, I do. Um... The, uh, this is all very interesting, and, and, and thank you very much, Carla, uh, for this. Um, you've been talking, uh, as I understand it, mostly about uh, uh, human security-centered approaches to contemporary conflicts. And I, I just wondered, um, uh, since I mean, there's probably a bunch of historians in the, in the audience, um, how you think that this this kind of approach to warfare might be applied to um, the history of war rather than to contemporary conflicts or how, or how you see that developing. Thank you so much for the question. Um, so one of the one of the courses, I'm going to start with my teaching and then I'll, I'll try to answer your question that way. One of the courses I, I teach is uh, on gender, women, and war, and one of the ways in which we've had we've had the opportunity to look at um, critical approaches, feminist approaches, but also um, how they intersect with human security paradigms has been um, in our understanding or our revisiting of historical conflicts, right? And so um, we, you know, we've looked at um, sort of some of the tactics used um, in Ireland. Um, we've it, in former conflicts, we've looked at Greece, we've looked at, you know, uh, conflicts in which we really see a lot of the discourse was focused on sort of um, the uh, movements for liberation, um, you know, trying to remove or move for democracy, but we haven't really examined uh, the experiences of, of people um, in these conflicts. And so trying to see if we can um, sort of mine those, those oral histories or written histories of people who've experienced these conflicts in very different ways. And how does that shape then our understanding of war and conflict in, in various uh, ways, I think is really important. It's tricky, right? We only have uh, resources uh, that we can access for sure. And so I think that's always a challenge. Um, but there are, you know, really interesting um, examples of, of looking at um, prisoner accounts, particularly in Ireland, uh, women who were imprisoned at the turn of the century, um, tortured, right, who are, were affiliated with sort of um, uh, pro-independence movements, those kinds of things that are really interesting, I think, when you start to understand the ways in which um, gender played a role, the way in which uh, race and religion played a role in terms of the kinds of tactics used in conflict to try to repress um, civilian movements, right? And I think, and social movements. And I think that's really part of what we understand human security to mean. Can we examine these historical conflicts from different perspectives and try to get a better sense of how diverse groups of people experienced conflict and war? Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Ian. Um, really interesting question. Of course, if anyone else does have uh, questions, either feel free to, to type them or or ask. Um, we have one from from Chris in the the chat there. Uh, taking Ian's question to the other extreme, uh, would you be optimistic that the world will be a safer place in say fifty years time? Oh, that's a huge question. <laughs> Um, well, I think I'm in agreement that we have a really hard time, I think, as academics predicting the future. So I'm going to try to just uh, 
uh, provide comments. Um, I think there are some um, interesting trends in terms of uh, our movement to think about security in a much more nuanced way, which I think offers some opportunity um, for um, the enhancement of people's experience of security in our in our day to day. Um, I, I think so when we uh, examples of this when we think about the ways in which uh, we are moving collectively right to to try um, to focus on things like climate change as a collective right as a at the global governance level and at the state level um, I think you're right that there are always challenges to that there are always dissenting voices there are always uh, perspectives that are going to derail I think collective um, uh, consensus around the sort of major threats that we see um, on the planet today, but I'm 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 more optimistic given the kinds of um, uh, rhetoric and political discourse that we've seen emerging, at least consensus around um, somewhat of a belief in the uh, need to protect our planet. Um, I think there is we're seeing this evidence moving towards. Um, you know, an acknowledgement that collectively we need to understand these transnational issues um, in a way that's much more global in perspective. So that sort of gives me um, some semblance of, of hope. Um, I also think to some degree, the scholarship is moving finally in the right direction. When we start, we started talking a little more about um, issues around gender, um, intersectionality, racism, and the ways in which what we understand the world to be has been largely a product of, um, of Eurocentrism, right, and white supremacy. So that gives me, I think, some, some hope that we're starting to sort of undermine the status quo and think much more broadly about what security means and how we can move forward as a, uh, as, as a, as a collective. I do think there are worrying signs for sure, right? We've seen disintegration of um, democracy or democratic governance. We've seen a movement towards populism. Um, you know, there, there are some worrying trends, I think, that we must acknowledge, and we have to think about um, these trends in, in very thoughtful ways. And I think that's one of the ways that, um, you know, scholarship, activism, I think, will, will contribute. Yeah, just, just a, a thought kind of building on that. Um, I suppose, thinking in the historical perspective, if people wanted to, to push for change, um, certainly protest would work, you know, rioters, endemic in the early modern world. Um, but if you really want to push for change, violence seems to be or seem to be historically the way to do it. Um, and then if we look at that on a, a grander scale in the 20th century, liberation movements left, right and center, outside of the European world largely, um, and especially in the, the decolonizing world, um, violence seemed to be the default option in some ways, um, you know, partly driven by political rhetoric, fine. But um, how far do you see that as changing now? Do you think we've, we've moved past that um, and moved on to, to a different way of attempting to, to enforce change? Or do you still think that violence is a default option for, for groups who want change? You know, that's a really difficult question. I think it always is. I mean, you know, I agree with you. I think oftentimes when um, social movements are not receiving the kind of attention that they need or they're being um, suppressed, right, by state leaders or other, um, you know, structural powers, um, oftentimes it's a mechanism to try to defend oneself or as you're, you know, you're right to say or to, to, to push for change, right? So, you know, I, I wouldn't condemn violence, um, you know, absolutely, but I would say that we have to be much more careful with, with how we understand violence and what it means, uh, particularly within our political strategizing, right? I, I, I think um, the, the greater concern for me has been the ways in which we use violence as a justification for reification of the state and its monopoly of control, right? So we see that with police repression and here in Baltimore, that's been an endemic issue, right? Uh, you know, the arms of the state are not neutral, right? Neither is violence. And so we have to think about uh, what is the purpose of this violence? Who is it targeting? Um, you know, and, and I think having a, a broader conversation around those questions 
I think is really, really important uh, because I think you're right. Is it necessary to have violence to, you know, to, to push for change? I'm not sure it, sh it ought to be. It has been <laughs> traditionally. It's not the only way, right? We've seen, I always talk about student movements being one of the, you know, most important ways that we've seen uh, change happen, particularly um, in the West, right? So um, it doesn't have to be violent, but I think you're right. Are there other mechanisms that, that can be used for change? Are there ways in which violence as a targeted, right, um, uh, you know, behavior can be useful. And what does that mean? And so, you know, not to justify violence or to throw it out altogether, but I certainly agree with you that looking for other mechanisms through which to push for change, I think is, is vital in, a, in democratic systems in particular, right? That should be the point that we should be able to sort of uh, push for change through nonviolent means if at all possible. But I think you're right, you know, um, these are unequal dynamics that we're, we're experiencing. And certainly um, historically we've seen those dynamics shift the ways in which um, um, social movements are trying to press for change. Absolutely. Sorry, if I just been muttering on. Mute You're fine now. <laughs> I think I pressed the mute button or something by accident. Um, it, that was all deep and meaningful stuff that uh, I'll never remember again. Um, but the the idea that the arms of the state aren't neutral, I think, was was a, a point um, I, I thought was really interesting that you made. Um, do you think that is starting to to change at all? I mean, do you think that states have started to realize that their use of force and violence is not neutral and therefore they do need to to interrogate what they're doing with that, both internally but also externally, um, in, in terms of you no know, projection of power uh, abroad? Or is it something that people are still trying to persuade themselves of, you know, that, that police violence is fine because it is neutral? Uh, because the police protect everyone. Um, you know, it, it suits some people to believe that. Um, so do you see this changing um, in, in scholarship and in wider society, or do you think this is still, um, you know, a, a continuing problem? You know, there's so much debate uh, around these kinds of questions, particularly here in the United States, but they are questions for every country, right? I, I, I think, uh, you know, we've had um, areas of intellectual scholarship that have, are far more advanced on these questions that I think my own in international relations has been, although we're moving in that direction. Um, we have a lot more interesting uh, scholarship, uh, particularly at Johns Hopkins, that's studying the sort of use of, of uh, government repression and the ways in which it's gendered and sexualized and racialized, right, and comes from, you know, a history of imperialism. And so we, I think, increasingly are, are moving in that direction, but there is a lot of debate. There's no question that there's not consensus around, you know, state use of violence, particularly when it comes to um, enforcing criminal justice, right? Um, so I think there's you know, we're, I'm sitting in one of the areas of the world where this is an ongoing and very um, important uh, topic. Um, but I, I do think that it, it stems from a discourse that we haven't had sufficient, um, sufficiently in the United States, and I think in a lot of Western democracies around our own um, histories, right? Um, and I think we're seeing that when it comes to, um, you know, all manner of uh, of state repression, particularly histories of settler colonialism and genocide and all of these things in my own country in Canada, this has been the ongoing question, right? What, what responsibility do states have to look forward, but also back at the ways in which they've used their power um, to repress uh, populations, right? Under their own authority. And I think that's something that has to continue um, and we need to press for further inquiry along those lines. Absolutely, despite the debate, I think even because there's so much uh, debate around these questions. It's a fascinating um, kind of intersection here between state violence internally and you know, warfare and, and conflict. Yes. Um, and I suppose, you know, the, the 19th century perspective was that they were, were rather divorced. You had an international war, the 
the army could be used for internal policing, but they were seen as different things. I suppose that drifts through the 20th century. I suppose my final question is, is are we seeing that as changing? Are we seeing warfare now? And you, you kind of alluded to this in your talk, but are we seeing warfare now as something being reconceptualized by Western states to include internal security measures that have nothing to do necessarily with external conflict? Are we seeing a much more integrated approach to this entire idea of, of national interest, national security? You know, I, I, I wouldn't say that the states themselves are taking up that call for sure. <laughs> Um, I would say, however, that there's a much greater understanding of the connections between our own histories of imperialism, uh, you know, enslavement, uh, settler colonialism, and the ways in which we engage with the world um, in more contemporary issues and through conflict. Um, do I think the states or states in the West in particular have, have been sufficiently informed and enlightened on those topics? Certainly not. Uh, and, and I think that's largely the role of, of intellectuals, of activists to press for greater acknowledgement uh, and greater movement on these kinds of ideas. Um, I, I think there are obviously political implications of looking back uh, at some of these things, right? And what does it mean uh, for how a state understands its own reputation in the world and its legitimacy as an international actor? Uh, certainly th those, there are implications for that. But I think, you know, more and more, there's a call, I think, at the local level and globally uh, for countries to really um, start to um, take a position where they're reflecting on these and their own roles in repressive um, uh, processes. Um, and, and, and again, I think this idea that we, we separate sort of what happens domestically uh, from the international system is starting, at least in, in scholarship, to fall away, right? We're seeing much more interconnection. Um, one of my colleagues, um, Robbie Shilliam, who talks about race and international relations at Johns Hopkins and writes on these topics, you know, has talked a lot about how we've always siphoned off um, these areas of, of research. So, you know, in, in intellectual discourse, we've had sort of, you know, women's studies over here and, you know, black studies over here. And we've sort of political science and history have sort of uh, taken their own, uh, own path. I think that's problematic. And I think those are not neutral decisions that were created along these sort of intellectual lines. And I think that's true of domestic and international spheres as well, that there are mechanisms uh, that were used to try to um, cat, uh, sort of um, siphon off some of these concerns from these broader national interest concerns. I think that has to stop. I think we need to start thinking in much broader ways about the interconnections uh, between the domestic and international realm and the ways in which our own histories, right, have influenced the way that we engage in the world, whether it's through violence or other means. Yeah, really, really interesting. Thanks. There's a, another question popped up there um, from Chris. Uh, how would you assess the growing influence of China in terms of its security relationship with Western states as a former victim of colonialism? I mean, that's a great question. Um, I, I think China is an interesting case because of the way that it has sort of shifted its approach over time, right? Um, I'm not a, Chinese, a China expert, so I won't speak authoritatively about this, but I think in terms of global trends, particularly looking at the discourse around global governance, China has been great, much more implicated, right? Um, in these sort of global conversations around human rights protections, uh, while because it needs to be at the table, there's no question. It has a much greater influence over economic trade than I think we ever really realized. And I think that's becoming very, very clear, um, particularly in the US, and the bilateral relationship with China, the problems with this sort of trade war that we've had between the United States and China has really, I think, laid um, sort of laid the truth uh, bare about the sort of role that China plays economically. But I think you're absolutely right. You know, China is rising. There is, I think, a lot of concern about what kind of influence China is, will have um, as a former, right, as a colonial power itself, right? Uh, and I think, um, you know, given the sort of level of um, authoritarianism within China, right? I think that's going to be really concerning. I, I work a little bit, I've worked, done some work on the uh, Uyghur uh, crisis in China. And, you know, I'm really concerned about the ways in which, um, you know, China is repressing certain elements of its population, human rights activists, 
um, how it sort of, you know, isn't acknowledging, I think, some of the ways in which uh, its role uh, has really um, influenced or elevated repressive tactics. So I think China is going to be one to watch, particularly the ways in which it engages uh, with both its, you know, Asian allies, but also um, with the United States and Western powers as well. Yeah, no, I guess China is a, a really interesting one because it's achieved this position of predominance in, a, in quite a different way to, to other powers, um, with, with arguably less violence against the other major powers that it's, it's kind of competing against. Um, and you know, if I'm thinking back to the, the 18th and 19th centuries, you know, the major powers that are growing are doing so through either expansion of territory or through violence generally, but China's growth seems to be rather different. Um, I guess though it's a, to watch this space at the moment for China. I think so. I, I think its economic influence has been major, right? We've seen how its influence in parts of Africa has has been heightened. Um, it has huge um, connections in Latin America, um, and of course in the Western world. So I think the, you're absolutely right. The way that China has sort of um, you know, uh, accelerated its influence through uh, ep economic trade, through financial investment has been sort of interesting to see, um, particularly as it maintains quite an authoritarian posture, right, um, domestically. And I think that's um, something that we sort of have to wait and see how that evolves. But there are obviously um, elements of that that are, that are concerning. Ian, uh, do you have a, a comment? Uh, yeah, the... Um, um... It strikes me, and, and this is, uh, well, I guess this is almost simplistic, but uh, isn't, isn't part of the problem the fact that uh, the way the international community is ordered is on the basis of nation states still. And uh, although, uh, you know, people have talked about the sort of death of the nation state, actually, there's not much sign of that. Uh, and um, uh, so as a consequence, uh, states tend to uh consider security issues in terms of the protection of the state rather than human security because human security is kind of extra national you're then talking about populations which are not your own by definition or even you're talking about members of your own population who don't share the same interests as you so so further to that i wonder what you think about the the kind of rise or the reassertion of, of nationalism which seems to be a, a contemporary phenomenon how do you feel about that? You know, I, I, I think, um, you know, one of the elements we've seen over the course of the sort of post 9-11 world, but I think emerging uh, largely after 2008, after the economic crisis, we've seen a, a real rise in nationalism, right? Um, particularly sort of right-wing nationalism um, in Europe, in the United States, we've seen this um, in sort of um, Eastern Europe in particular. Um, so I think you're absolutely right. You know, how, do, how, do, how does that play into this sort of discussion about uh, watering down or diluting at least the role of the state when we think about security issues. And I think you're, you're right to sort of say there is this sort of other dynamic where the state system itself is being reified by these nationalistic, I think, movements. I, I think one of the things to think about, though, um, when we think about nationalism is the what is the foundation of those movements, right? Why are these groups sort of holding on to these nationalistic symbols um, what fuels these kind of movements? Is it a real sort of dedication to the state or is it about other things? Which I, you know, the more I think about and read about sort of these movements, I, I'm concerned that really the symbols of the state are what are more important, right? Um, and that it's about disenfranchisement more than anything else. It's about the ways in which democracy possibly hasn't worked uh, for everyone or hasn't been internalized um, in the same ways for everyone. And I think um, uncovering the, the real dynamics around these movements, I think are gonna be really, really important. Um, I think on the sort of, at the state level, I don't really think um, that we're going to see the state disappear. I mean, I, I think that's a very difficult sort of uh, uh, future to imagine. I do think that states themselves have to and must understand more and more, uh, given the current situation that we're in with the pandemic and climate change at the forefront of our security concerns, 
that if they maintain traditional state-centric considerations, particularly in the ways in which they understand their national interests, we are in for a very difficult uh, few decades. And so I'm not sure that, you know, that realization will emerge um, sufficiently or quickly enough for us to start to um, prioritize um, collective governance, but I certainly think um, that it's a make or break time that we're in where states really do have to think beyond um, their own sort of traditional nas national interests. Um, and how that plays into sort of national uh, or nationalist movements, I think is going to be a very interesting one to watch as well. Thanks very much. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not terribly optimistic about that, I think either. So, but uh, thank you anyway. Any, any other questions uh, from anyone? Um, we don't want to end on a pessimistic note. Uh, everyone's had a, a chance to, to ask the questions they want. There have been some, uh, some very interesting comments here. Um, I, I do have a, a couple of other things, I, I guess, to ask, but I think I, I have um, trespassed on your time long enough, Carla. I don't want to keep you here all night. Um, just answering my questions. Um, but if anyone else has does have anything to say, uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. No. Um, well, I, I guess then it, it just remains for me to uh, to thank you very much for giving this talk. It was a fascinating talk and some some brilliant answers to questions there. Um, and it certainly made me rethink, uh, you know, my, my considerations of war and violence um, and simply the extent to which uh, this is is kind of integral to to all forms of power, uh, and the 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 breadth uh, of things that we must consider if we are trying to understand uh, war and conflict, especially in the modern world, but also uh, historically as well. Um, so thank you very much for for a fantastic paper, um, and uh, I'll, I'll thank you on behalf of all uh, attendees and participants as well. Uh, it's been absolutely fascinating. Um, thank you very much, Carla. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Goodbye.